together as children of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, to worship Him in spirit and in truth. Amen. And God welcomes us to make confession before Him and one another that we might receive His mercy and forgiveness. So we pray, merciful and loving God, Your Word reminds us that whoever conceals their sins does not prosper, but the one who confesses and renounces their sins finds mercy. We declare and depend on this promise for us as we confess our sins before you. And we pray together. Heavenly Father, have mercy on us according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out our transgressions, wash away all our iniquity, and cleanse us from our sin. And God has sent his Son to show his infinite love and forgiveness for all. Hear again the good news. In the holy name of Jesus Christ, by his coming and sacrifice, your sins are forgiven. God has remembered them no more. Let us pray together. Father in heaven, at the baptism of Jesus in the river Jordan, you proclaimed him your beloved son and anointed him with the Holy Spirit. Make all who are baptized into Christ faithful in their calling to be your children and inheritors with him of everlasting life. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. But now this is what the Lord says. He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt for your ransom, Cush and Seba in your stead. Since you are precious and honored in my sight, and because I love you, I will give you people in exchange for you nations in exchange for your life. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will bring your children from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, who I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him, for we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. The word of God for the people of God. Today's gospel text is from Luke, the third chapter, beginning at the 15th verse. The people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah. John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but the one who is more powerful than I will come, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winning, winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And with other words, John exhorted the people and proclaimed the good news to them. 
But when John rebuked Herod the Tetrarch because of his marriage to Herodias, his brother's wife, and all the other evil things he had done, Herod added this to them all. He locked John up in prison. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too, and he was praying. Heaven was, as he was praying, heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my son, with whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. This is the gospel of the Lord. We're going to be right here in the gospel of Luke today, so keep that handy. We'll begin our time together with prayer. Lord God, we thank you for the reminder of your power and your strength for us today. Give us, we pray, eyes to see, ears to hear, minds to understand, and hearts to receive these, your words before us. May then the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing to you, Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. We're remembering today the baptism of Jesus. This past summer, I had the great gift and blessing of being able to be over in Jordan at the site that is attributed to the baptism of Jesus. I was there. And as a Christian, a disciple, a a follower of Jesus, knowing about the baptism and knowing about this holy site, knowing about what God did in opening up the clouds and descending upon him uh, as like a dove and making the proclamation, this is my son, announcing to the world that here is the Messiah. As I got off the tour bus and started to walk down to the Jordan River, I was overwhelmed with emotion. Uh, The highlight by far of my trip, maybe the highlight of my life. I was thinking to myself as I walked down, looking at these other people from other countries and nations, maybe even other faiths. I knew a little bit about our guide. He told us about himself on the bus ride down. He's a Jordanian uh, Muslim. And I thought to myself, well, I I wonder what this means for him. So I decided to be a little bit bold, and I asked him, I said, you know, uh, this is really overwhelming for me, knowing what happened in this spot as uh, one who is a Christian. I said, "What what does this site mean for you? just out of curiosity. He's very learned. He spoke English very well. In fact, French and Spanish also, as as well as uh, his native tongue, Arabic. And he said to me, well, uh, it means a lot of money. Okay, there you go. See, for him, it wasn't really a holy site at all. It just meant... uh, These Westerners mostly would come over and make their pilgrimage, and we would pay him to go see the spot where Jesus was baptized. I got down to the River Jordan and was sorely disappointed. (laughs) It's just a little trickle of a thing. Uh, Muddy, reeds everywhere. And uh, on the other side was Israel. Down the middle was this uh, bright yellow rope that separated the borders between Jordan and Israel. I saw this huge edifice and uh, welcome center. I saw people making their pilgrimage from the other side in Israel. And I thought to myself, I wonder what this means for uh, the Israelites. I wonder what this site means for for the Jews. You know, it reminds us, this story, that each of us will be held accountable to the greatest question ever asked. And that is, who is Jesus? John the Baptist was asked this question in our text. If you look with me at verse 15. You see, the Israelites, the the Jews, the people of God, those whom God had chosen 
They were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah. You see, they had this messianic expectation, this promise from God that He would send His anointed, that He would send His Son, that He would send the one who would uh, free Israel and save, bring salvation and deliverance and redemption for the people of God. It had been, as we read this text, 400 years since Israel had experienced a prophet. We look back at the Old Testament prophets, and there are so many that came and spoke on behalf of God. Most of the message of the prophets, the, as the mouthpiece of God, they were saying, repent and turn back to the Lord. And this is exactly what John the Baptist is doing. His baptism, as he has explained it in other uh, of the four Gospels, is a baptism of repentance. He's calling the people back to God. He's saying to them, as every prophet over the ages said, that God needs us to return to Him. We've strayed from the Lord our God. And so repent and come be baptized. And the people were ready. Gosh, after 400 years, there was not a person living in, that had even heard about uh, a prophet. There's not a person living that had an ancestor that they remember connecting with, that had seen or heard a prophet in their own time. 400 years is a long time. And you can imagine the excitement now. Here's a prophet. Maybe this is the Messiah. John somehow gets wind of their question as they're wondering, might he possibly be the Messiah? Verse 16 John answers the question directly. He says to them, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. See, John says to the people, I I'm just a prophet in these words. We may not see those in our context, but that's what he's saying when he says, I baptize with water. He's saying to them, people, what I'm doing is no big deal. This is ordinary water, and I'm just baptizing for repentance. Nothing special is happening here. In fact, the Jews would know all about ritualistic and ceremonial washing. It was a common practice among the Israelites. They were commanded it in the Old Testament, in the Torah, in the law. And so being washed for repentance, this cleansing and cleaning, was nothing new. It was actually very common. And then at the end of this particular section, verse 18 we're reminded by Luke of the ordinary, common, prophetic message of John. With many other words, John exhorted the people and proclaimed the good news to them. He did not bring the good news in the sense that he was the good news. That was the work of Jesus. But he was the mouthpiece of God that told the people, Jesus is coming. The Messiah is here. He's close. He's at hand. But again, kind of ordinary prophetic stuff. But he doesn't stop there. He uses this little conjunction. He says, but one who is more powerful than I will come. He's referencing his cousin, his cousin Jesus. John is the son of Elizabeth. Jesus is the son of Mary. And he says three things about the Messiah as he juxtaposes himself, the very common John, against the very uncommon Jesus. He says, this Jesus is more powerful, more powerful than I. And he's not talking about physical power here, of course. We know that. But he's talking about the personal authority of Jesus. This Jesus is the Son of God. This Jesus has the authority of heaven. This Jesus created the heavens and the earth. This Jesus, if he wanted to, could call down the heavenly host. 
and take care of things, bring this world to rights once and for all. This is the powerful, authoritative Jesus, of which he says, as he qualifies and defines and gives the illustration to the statement, of which the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. John is declaring and making proclamation, I am not even worthy to be the lowly servant of this Jesus who has come. You see, servants would often be required to untie the sandals and then wash the feet of their master. And in the the biblical era, people wore sandals without socks. It's in the Bible. (laughs) So their feet would be terribly dirty. They'd uh, make these big pilgrimages, or even if they went out to, to shop in the marketplace, they'd come home and their feet would be dirty. And it was the servant's uh, role to bend down and wash the, untie the sandals and then wash the feet of the master. Even sometimes wash the feet of those strangers who were coming into the master's home so the home wouldn't get dirty. And John says, no, I'm not even worthy to do that to the one who has this power. John has an understanding of Jesus that glorifies and magnifies the Messiah before the people. If you think baptizing with water is important, he says, because you're making a big deal of it. John had quite a following at this point. He says, one who is coming is even more powerful than I. He says as he continues at the end of verse 16, He will baptize. He, this one who is more powerful, this Messiah, this this Jesus, will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. John says, I I just baptize with water. How hard is that? It's not a big deal. I baptize for repentance. But Jesus, the Messiah, the uncommon Jesus, not the common John, brings a baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire. What does that mean? It means that Jesus has the authority to call on the the hosts of heaven, God himself. He is God himself to empower, to enlighten, to call down the Holy Spirit upon the people. And he will baptize not only with Holy Spirit, but with fire. What does this mean? It, It means that Jesus will purify by the power of the Holy Spirit the people of Israel, all who receive Him. In antiquity and even in today's world, what what we do to refine gold or make it one substance is what? We we dig it out of the, the rock, we put it through a what? Furnace. And we burn the impurities away so the the only thing that remains is pure gold. There's purity there. And that's what Jesus is referencing, or John is referencing about Jesus, that Jesus will refine us in the fires of the Holy Spirit. We will be made pure. That is the gospel. Verse 18 says that, that John continued to preach the good news. That's what gospel means, literally. It is the gospel. It's it's the good news. It's the proclamation of forgiveness of sins that we might be made pure and holy before a loving God. And this is John's proclamation here on this day. I remember growing up singing a song. uh, The chorus went like this, White as snow, white as snow, Though my sins are as scarlet, I have been made white as snow. How? By the baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire. By the baptism of Jesus. This is the powerful work of the Messiah. And not only that, says John, but this Jesus. He has the authority of heaven. This Jesus baptizes with the authority of God to bring redemption and salvation, make us pure by the Holy Spirit and fire. But, ah, that's not all. Verse 17, John says, His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear the threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. You hear the power in these words? This is the Jesus 
that we often forget. This is the Jesus who is no longer politically correct to preach. That Jesus would come and be the judge of all people. This is the Jesus that we forget when we only remember our buddy, our friend, the one who wants to make everybody in life happy, the squishy, the soft, the fluffy Jesus that we keep in our pockets. And when we're in trouble, we take him out and we pet him and say, Jesus, help me. And yet John says, Jesus is much more than that. Jesus will come to judge the living and the dead. We profess it in our creed every Sunday. And we miss those words if we don't remember that he's the one that will come with winnowing fork in hand. This is the power and the authority of heaven above. And it's coming. And he's coming. And so for those who believe, we have nothing to fear. The separation of the wheat and the chaff is a gift from God by His grace. The wheat are those that are collected into the barn of the authority of heaven. The chaff are those who have been cast to the barn floor to be burned with unquenchable fire. It's the sorting of the sheep and the goats. This is the uncommon and powerful Jesus, not the common John. And this is what we're reminded about when we think about the baptism of Jesus, the God of heaven, the creator of the the universe, says uh, above the river Jordan in that day, in this, by the way, desolate and lowly place, you think we live in a desert? Go to Jordan. That's a desert. This God who proclaims, this is my son. This is him. This is the Messiah. He has come. This is the anointed one. And I love him. And I am well pleased. You will have to, in your lifetime, however many years God gives you, answer many questions. But one stands out above them all. There's no comparison. And that question is simply this. Who is Jesus? The answer to that question holds your life in the balance. Amen statement of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Together, out of obedience to your command, this then is how you should pray. With one heart, and one voice we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.